So let's look at discrete time convolution and we'll do it looking at an example. And here's the equation for discrete time convolution. Two functions, x and h, convolve together. And I think it helps to think about these in the example case of a linear time invariant system. So the input is x, the impulse response of the system is h, and the output is y. And so let's look at this example here. So this is an example where the impulse response of the system, h, looks like this. It has no response for negative time, and it has an three responses at three times after the impulse. So this is what we call as impulse response, uh, and it's got values, non-zero values, at three elements at time zero, time one, and time two. And in this case, in this example, they all equal one. And then there's zero everywhere else. So let's look at this example. Now let's think of a signal, an input signal. Let's look at this example where there's no input for negative time. And then at time zero, the input is a half, then is followed at time one by an input of two, and then zero input after that, no more input after that. So let's look at this example. So one thing we could do now is to start calculating the convolution using the equation. And we can look at this equation and think to ourselves, how do we evaluate this infinite summation? Well, we can notice that for this example, xk is mostly zeros. So most of the terms in this summation will equal zero, because xk will equal zero for those values of k. So there's only two times when xk does not equal zero. We look down here and we see, well, it's when k equals zero. Now this is plotted, I'll just make the point, this is plotted xn as a function of n, but if we want xk, we just change the variable. And so this, this x of square brackets is a function. The thing in the square brackets is what you're plotting it against. So we can plot it against n, or we could plot it against k. So this functional shape remains the same in both cases. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, so x, there's only two terms here that are non-zero, when x, x of naught and x of one. So there'll be two terms in here. Now for this, we can start uh, a process of calculating it for every value of n. So let's start with n equals minus one. So here I've written it out for n equals minus one. So y of minus one equals, we're starting with one value and we're gonna have to do it for all the others. Uh, so y of minus one equals, well, as we said, there's only two terms in this sum that are non-zero. So x of zero is the first one, and it's, going to, it's when k equals zero. So this is h of n, which in this case is minus one. So we've got minus one minus zero, because this is k equals zero. So that term there is x of zero times h of minus one. The second term that is non-zero is when you have k equals one. So x of one here, and now what is this, what's inside the brackets here? Well, it's going to be h, and we need to work out what's inside the brackets. Well, n equals minus one, that's what we're calculating it for. So n equals minus one, and k for this second term equals one. So we've got minus one, so we've got minus one minus one, which is minus two. Okay, and then we, we put in the numbers that these are. Okay, so these x of zero, so this equals x of zero equals one half. So we've got one half times h of minus one, well, h of minus one is also equal to zero. So that's a half times zero plus x of one equals two. So we've got two times h of minus two, which is also equal to zero. So this number here equals zero. So we've worked out one of the values for our answer, y of minus one. y of minus one equals zero. Now we could do y of zero, for example, and start increasing the value of n, we're gonna work it out for all values of n. Okay, so this is, uh, I'll just quickly uh, write out one example here. So I've got x of zero again, because still we've only got two terms in this summation that are non-zero. So it'll be x of zero times h, in this case, h of zero, because we'll have uh, n is zero and k is zero, um, plus x of one, because that's the second one that's not zero, times, in this case, we've got h of minus one. And now we can look at our graph and work out what they are. So again, this equals a half times h of zero. h of zero is one. Uh, plus this one, of course, is two uh, times h of minus one. Well, that's still zero. So this equals one half.
And you could keep doing this for every single value of n. Okay, and that's what a computer would do. So that's the way you would do it in a computer. But it can become tedious to do it this way if you're doing it by hand. Uh, so let's think about it and get a bit more intuition. So I always like to think of uh, what's really going on in a convolution. So let's think about that for a minute and think about it in terms of uh, the example of a, an impulse response uh, in a system. And that's a good, good way to think about it. So let's think about our input system and let's think, well, let's break up this into two different impulse, uh, the impulses into our system. One of them at time zero and the other one at time one. So I'm going to draw this now with the two components of the input separated. So now we've got a component that is of height half. This is an impulse at time zero of height one half. And then the second component is an impulse at time one of height two. And so these are two components of our overall input. Of course, our overall input is this one, the same as the one we had before but we're now breaking it up. And because it's linear, and because these are separate orthogonal basis functions, each delta function offset in time is orthogonal to the other ones. If I multiply this one by this one, I'll get zero. So I can, uh, I can do them each separately and then add them up. Okay, so that's the best way, uh, a good way, I think, to think about uh, the discrete time signal. It's a sequence of delta functions next to each other, all of which could be written out separately and then added up. So we can now do the same thing in terms of the output of our system. So this is the input of our system. So if this system, if this input went into our system, we know that the impulse response comes out. So the impulse response to an impulse of, of height one is given to us over here. So an impulse response to an input of height half will be half of this because it's linear. So the output that comes out of our system from the from an, impulse, an input which is an impulse response of height half will be the impulse response multiplied by half. So these are a half. So this is exactly the output that comes from the signal uh, for this impulse response if you put half in. Now the same thing holds for this one, but this one is happening at time one. So this impulse is shifted to time one. So the system will respond after time one to this input and it will be responding with a height of two times the impulse response. So in this case, the impulse response is one, so it's gonna be responding with a height two. So now we're getting two coming out, starting at time one, because this impulse came at time one. And now it is responding in exactly the way that the impulse response tells us, and with a scaled amplitude because this input was twice as big. So hopefully you can see that this, this is a good way to think about it. The input to a system gives an, an impulse, into a system gives the impulse response coming out. A different imp impulse, time shifted and with a different scale, gives the, the impulse response again, time shifted with a different scale. And then because it's linear, we can add these up to find the answer. So the answer will be nothing before time equals zero. It'll be a half at time equals zero, it will be the addition of these two, which is two and a half uh, at time equals one. So that's two and a half at time equals one. Uh, same thing at time equals two, it'll be two and a half. At time equals three, well, this has gone back to zero again. Uh, so this is back to being a height of two. And then every, our impulse response has finished by that time. There's no more response to any of the impulses. And so uh, we're back to zero. So this is our answer to our convolution question by thinking of it in terms of impulses at different times, which was come about by breaking up our input signal into its components. And then we think about each component separately as being an impulse to the system. And then of course, we get the impulse response coming out. Because it's linear, we can add them all up. So here's the answer directly without doing any mathematics at all. Uh, and here is this, the uh, answer doing with the formula, and you'll see that you can get the same answer. I mean, here we've got y naught equals a half. Over here, this is y naught equals a half. It's the same answer, of course. But I think it really helps to think about uh, convolution in discrete time in this way, uh, in terms of the impulse responses in a graphical way. So if this has uh, helped you, please give the video a thumbs up.
helps others to find the video. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page in the link below where there's a full categorized link list of all the videos on the channel.